Good morning. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'd like to especially thank Ellen and her colleagues for, for giving me this opportunity. I'm a, a lapsed academic, and while I don't miss preparing lectures and grading papers, I do miss interacting with students and other intellectually curious people. So thank you, Ellen, and thank you all for coming. Uh, the classic picture of the tragedy of the commons, which Ellen painted, is of too many people chasing a finite resource without rules to constrain their consumption. What I'm going to talk about this morning is sort of the flip of that. It's not about a surplus of players in a finite ground, but a deficit. Too few states, institutions, and people providing a scarce resource. That is, the rescue of people who get into trouble on the high seas. And by the high seas, I mean parts of seas and oceans that are outside the territorial waters of any state. The most vulnerable to suffering and death at sea are migrants and refugees who are traveling under a double burden. They themselves are not authorized to enter the country that's their intended destination. And the boats they sail in don't have permission to enter that country's ports. This double jeopardy frames the problem of irregular or unauthorized maritime migration. My subject today and, and for quite a few years, actually it's been a concern practically my whole life. I'm a naval captain's daughter and so protection for people at sea has always had a particular resonance for me. Unlike many problems of the global commons, um, it's not that there are no established rules for rescue at sea. The obligation to rescue people at risk of being lost at sea, regardless of their nationality or their legal status or the situation in which they're found, is codified in at least three widely ratified binding international treaties. 1974, the Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea, known as SOLAS. The 1979 Convention on Maritime Search and Rescue, or SAR. And a 1988 Protocol, <coughs> excuse me, to SOLAS. The most comprehensive treaty on uh, maritime law, which I'm sure you'll hear more about later, uh, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, also specifies the obligation to assist and rescue people at peril on the sea. Other bodies of law also come into play um, depending on circumstances of rescues. Refugee law, human rights law, transnational criminal law, and property law uh, when private uh, vessels are involved in rescues. The SAR, the Search and Rescue Convention, attempts to overcome the problem that the high seas are not under the jurisdiction of any particular state. So it divides the world's seas into uh, zones, search and rescue zones, and it obligates the states that are parties to that convention to cooperate to, in patrolling uh, these zones and calling in rescue operations when they're needed. This slide shows the search and rescue zones in the Mediterranean. SAR missions controlled by each responsible country um, alert nearby vessels to uh, the presence of a, a ship or boat that's in distress. And the sh those ships are notified um, about the presence of these vessels, and they're ob obligated to do their best to rescue people who are in danger, including the, by taking them on board if necessary and if it can be done safely. The problems come with disembarkation. States have not agreed on an interpretation of the rules 
for when people are picked up, where they should be disembarked, where they should be given a chance to leave the, sh the rescue ship. Some NGOs, you may be aware, run rescue ships, uh, particularly in the Mediterranean. And those ships that have rescued people in danger of, of drowning have been barred from the ports of Italy and other European countries. They have indeed been prosecuted for uh, aiding smugglers uh, in their attempts to rescue the victims of, uh, of smugglers. This, understandably, uh, plus the, uh, I should, should say that the, when a commercial ship rescues people at sea, it, it imposes a considerable financial and administrative burden on those ships. They have to feed and water and shelter the people they pick up. Uh, one of the first big rescue cases that came to, the, to international attention uh, was a Norwegian ship called the Tampa, which rescued some 400 people uh, in, uh, off the coast of Australia and was denied entry by Australia. And this was a ship that was built to house maybe 40 crew members, and it took on 400 people, wasn't allowed to land. And for weeks, there was a standoff uh, where people were in, you know, it was a big container ship. It didn't have shelter for that many people. Eventually resolved, but uh, only after a, a great deal of tense negotiation between Norway and Australia and um, other uh, the countries from which the people had come. This, these controversies have resulted in, among other things, a reluctance of ships to rescue people at sea on, on uh, busy uh, navigation routes. Some commercial ships will turn off their transponders so they can't receive messages from the search and rescue missions. And others will just, migrants report, just being ignored by ship after ship that passes them when the migrants are in danger. Aboard a ship, the passengers and crew are under the authority of the shipmaster or, or captain, who is, at least in theory, under the jurisdiction of the state whose flag the ship is flying. But some countries, uh, you may have heard Liberia is a prominent one, offer so-called flags of convenience for a price and make no attempt or have no capacity to enforce their own laws or international treaties. Believe it or not, landlocked Mongolia offers flags of convenience. It's often hard to contact the authorities of states like this when a vessel carrying its flag is challenged on the high seas for suspected smuggling or trafficking in persons. Then again, many migrant uh, vessels smuggling people are unflagged or file, uh, fly a false flag. They answer to, to the laws of no state, um, even in theory. Why is this so important? Damage to the global commons, which you're gonna hear a lot about today, damages our common heritage, damages livelihoods, compromises the future, and, and many other bad things. But exploitative behavior on the seas often leads to the direct loss of human lives, and many of them. In the Mediterranean alone, almost 28,000 people have perished in the last 10 years. And that's probably a gross underestimate, since many boats founder and leave no trace of their passengers. The impact of unauthorized arrivals is born unevenly, to say the least. Coastal areas of regions that are attractive to migrants are obviously the most affected, with islands that, are, that belong to those states um, the, the most heavily impacted. Uh, islands that are on heavily uh, trafficked, traveled routes, 
like the Greek islands of Lesbos and Kos between Greece and Turkey, Spain's Canary Islands, the island country of Malta, and perhaps most of all, Lampedusa. Let me show you where Lampedusa is. This little dot is Lampedusa. It is 70 miles off the coast of Tunisia, but it's part of Italy. It's 130 miles south of Sicily. It has a resident population of about 6,000 people, about the size of Wetumpka, Alabama, where I was born. Its land surface is less than eight square miles. It's small in every dimension. Lampedusa first came to the attention of the um, of international news media and policymakers in 2014 when a migrant boat caught fire a half a mile off the coast of Lampedusa. And there was, there was no capacity to respond to a blaze aboard a fairly big boat. 366 people died. And uh, Lampedusa was um, traumatized, as you can imagine. On Tuesday of last week, September 12th, more than 100 small boats reached Lampedusa. Lampedusa has always been remarkably welcoming and sympathetic to migrants. The population of 6,000, they set up a shelter for 600 migrants rescued who would, could stay there while they were assigned to other parts of Italy. Uh, after last week, um, there were more than 6,000 people in that shelter, 10 times its capacity. Um, and uh, the situation, not surprisingly, was getting a little tense. I mean, among the migrants who were desperate, felt that they were waiting too long to be able to get out of this very crowded and under-resourced center, um, and for the residents of Lampedusa, who were understandably nervous about what would happen, although, again, they remain very sympathetic in many of the residents of Lampedusa, who many of whom are fishermen, have participated in rescues at sea. One of the things that makes maritime migration different from other kinds of migration, whether by land or air, is that people who move by sea are not constantly within the jurisdiction of a state. A migrant can't board a flight or, or land in one without using an airport or strip that's located on the territory of a state. People who cross land borders go directly from one state to another. But people traveling in international waters enter a space in which the jurisdiction of states is less clear cut and much easier to avoid. I mean, you can see in some of these search and rescue zones, uh, some of them overlap, so there are controversies about who are responsible. This shaded area is an overlapping responsibility of Italy and Malta. And there was um, an incident uh, several years ago when those two countries couldn't agree on who was responsible for picking up people from a shipwreck. And those people ended up for three days clinging to the fences around a tuna pen until somebody could agree to rescue them. So the Italian Navy finally did. Uh, and, and the increasingly tight control that most states are trying to exercise over their airports and land borders uh, is one reason that irregular maritime migration is on the rise. But that increase is not the only reason that irregular uh, maritime migration gets so much attention. For one thing, it's exceptionally dangerous. I hope it isn't too crass to say that it's also exceptionally 
photogenic if anyone is around to take the picture of a boat on fire or capsizing people rushing to the rails of a boat and turning it over in hopes of being rescued or drowning people thrashing around in the water. I'm sure you've all seen these images. Some of you may remember uh, the heartbreaking uh, 2015 photo here of two-year-old Alan Kurdi, whose tiny body in his red t-shirt and blue shorts washed up on a Turkish beach in 2015, his sneakers still on his feet. He and his parents and his five-year-old brother had left Syria, hoping to join relatives who had already applied for them to join them in Canada. Only his father survived that crossing. Unusually, five men were actually convicted in Turkey of smuggling and causing the death of Aylan and other migrants. Equally unusual was the outpouring of sympathy around the world once that photo was published in newspapers, again, all over the world. And the sympathy, sympathy that it provoked, particularly in Germany, which was in the process of seeing the entry of about 800,000 migrants in 2015 and 2016. Alan's image in death made visible the human tragedy of people living in desperate insecurity who have no legal way of escaping the threats to their lives and livelihood caused by armed conflict, corruption, dire poverty, and structural inequality. On a global basis, uh, travel by sea accounts for a, a small proportion of refugees and migrants, but it gets a disproportionate share of attention from policymakers and the media and the public, partly because it's so dangerous and because it presents such challenges to sovereign control of national borders. It conjures up echoes of invasion to some people and prudent presents these heartrending uh, images when boats founder. For all of these reasons, uh, unauthorized travel by sea is often met with crisis-driven responses, the way um, which range all the way from rescue to harsh deterrence policies. And these crisis-driven responses are just rife with unintended consequences, even the good responses. For example, border control measures intended to deter unauthorized migration often leave refugees, totally legitimate refugees, with no legal way to escape their persecutors. More intense and sophisticated measures to intercept unauthorized boats often have taken the journeys out of hands of amateurs and put them into the hands of professional smugglers, many of whom are part of ruthless criminal networks. The increasingly sophisticated tactics used by smugglers poses a, a major challenge to policymakers and layers puts on an additional layer uh, of danger to the refugees' experience of persecution and flight. Criminals have, have perfected the art of engineered helplessness. In cases like off the coast of, of Libya, go back to that, uh, which is one of, one of the major uh, jumping off points for uh, smuggling, migrant smuggling, uh, the, the smugglers no longer attempt to evade authorities. Rather, they will deliberately sabotage boats as soon as they come within reach of rescuers, or sometimes as soon as they enter international waters. Um, and needless to say, the dangers there are, um, are, are phenomenal and uh, 
uncontrollable. Migrants may be encouraged to take greater risks and allow themselves to be crammed into unseaworthy boats because of the false confidence that search and rescue operations are more comprehensive than they can ever be on a vast and unpredictable sea. These dilemmas have no simple solutions. Uh, some states respond with deterrence, diversion, trying to direct boats to other places, denial, building barricades, uh, whether um, virtual or real. Nothing works. Um, and uh, they, most of those uh, tactics have only served to increase the dangers. Even the positive responses, rescue, protection, uh, burden sharing uh, among uh, states have, can have uh, unintended consequences, creating a moral hazard where migrants do believe they'll be rescued and allowed to enter states to make an asylum claim. I've talked mostly about the Mediterranean Sea today, mostly because it's close to major news centers and good communications, so we see the images of boats, flimsy boats meant to hold 50 people crammed with five times that many, see the pictures of the dead, hear the stories like the one you may have heard about two Syrian sisters, champion swimmers who towed their foundering boat to safety on a Greek island, towed it with a rope between their teeth, and swam. The European countries on the Mediterranean's north shore have good infrastructure and strong state capacity, so we know a lot about maritime migration across the Mediterranean, which is huge and consequential. But I don't want to leave you with the impression that unauthorized migration by sea is uniquely or even mostly a Mediterranean issue. The Bay of Bengal, the Caribbean, the maritime approaches to Australia, and more recently the English Channel have experienced major flows. One of the largest and most dangerous and least noticed flows is that between Yemen uh, and the Horn of Africa across the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. Most migrants, many of whom would qualify as refugees, travel from Somalia and Ethiopia to Yemen, which is in the middle of a major war, trying to reach the labor markets of Saudi Arabia or another Gulf state. 10 years ago, and for several years before that, these waters saw more migrant crossings than any other uh, region. Have any of you ever heard of that? Probably Sally has, but, um, but uh, you know, it, it's just not in the news. Uh, it's uh, worked by exceptionally brutal smugglers who don't hesitate if they see a Yemeni, one of the few Yemeni Coast Guard boats approaching to just throw their passengers overboard. Um, and remarkably, there have been some survivors of that treatment who have lived to tell the tale. The size uh, in, and even the direction of flows in that region have um, changed with the re state of the regional conflicts and the policies of the destination states. There have been credible, credible reports charging Saudi Arabian border guards of using lethal force against migrants trying to cross from Yemen in 2002 and 2003, killing documented killings of over 430 people and probably many more. Equally horrendous stories involving even larger numbers have emerged from the Bay of Bengal where the smugglers' response to a Thai government crackdown in 2015 was to abandon large ships with as many as 500 migrants on board, leaving the people who had paid to be smuggled to Malaysia or Thailand with little food or water 
some 1,600 people are known to have died in incidents like that. Problems this complex um, are not likely to be definitively resolved, but only resolved in different situations again and again. This implies that states will have to live, uh, learn to live with imperfection and engage in a continuous process of trial and error. What's very clear is that the particular, this particular tragedy of the commons is not going to end under present practices. Just three months ago, June 14th to be exact, one of the worst known migrant shipwrecks occurred in the Mediterranean. A ship called the Pylos, a fishing vessel, desperately overcrowded, carrying approximately 750 refugees and migrants, sank in the Mediterranean Sea, 47 nautical miles southwest of the coast of Greece. The vessel had departed five days earlier from Libya and was heading toward Italy. The passengers were mostly young men from Egypt, Pakistan, Syria, Palestine, but there were also children and families on board. They had reportedly each paid somewhere between $4,000 and $6,000 to be smuggled for the chance to reach a better life in Europe. The vessel measured about 66 by 98 feet. You can picture that. Maybe as big as that part of the room. 750 people on board, a little bigger actually, but not much. What makes this case stand out is that Greek and European authorities were passively watching the vessel for over 13 hours without intervention, despite several Mayday calls. It was only after the vessel capsized at 2 a.m. in calm waters that an actual rescue operation took place, but by then it was too late. Over 500 people are presumed to have died that night, about 100 women and children among them. I hate to leave you on such a depressing note, <laughs> but um, it, is, uh, it is a desperate situation. And many of the people on board these vessels are well aware of the risks that they're running. Uh, there have been various sort of information campaigns to tell people, don't get on a boat. It's very dangerous. You're taking a huge risk. And uh, I heard one young man rescued from one of these boats saying, you know, they tell us not to do it, that we're taking a big risk, but they have no idea what our lives are like in Mali. Or you're taking a big risk just to get out of bed in the morning. So deterrence has been proven over and over again not to work. Some other approach is desperately needed. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take a few questions. I think we have, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes. I know we got started a little late, so thank you. I see one question over here.
thank you. Uh, two, uh, two great questions. Um, I haven't uh, talked about uh, migrations across huge oceans, um, which uh, is um, less common because it's so much more difficult. Um, Australia is probably the country that's encountered that most um, <clears throat> from Southeast Asia, and particularly, um, well, from the time of the Vietnam War up till um, the, uh, until about five years ago when they instituted an extremely harsh policy that was basically uh, denial. You can't get there from here if you're a Rohingya refugee with a perfectly good case for international protection. Uh, the best you can hope for if you're intercepted by, an Aust by Australian authorities is to be sent to the barren island of Nauru or to Papua New Guinea where you can apply for asylum in either of those places. Um, not many people have that goal <laughs> when they set off. Um, across the Atlantic, um, you, you may be aware that there have been some huge smuggling operations involving container ships where migrants have been crammed into um, containers. Um, there, there have been incidents off the coast of New York, also off the coast, the Pacific coast of Canada. Um, and uh, in most cases, this, this requires um, a real needle in a haystack search for when migrants might be among the cargo of, of these vessels. But um, there, there haven't been too many of them that have come to attention. They, detection is, relies very heavily on intelligence um, and, um, and there are very heavy penalties for, uh, for that. On your second question, what can universities do? That's a really good, that's a really good question. Um, a number of universities around the world have, have sponsored or um, welcomed refugee students. And there's actually an organized um, uh, program now. It's an experimental program of private sponsorship of refugees into the United States. Um, and uh, the, um, the, the welcome, uh, which is uh, there, there are tools for involving universities in sponsoring and welcoming students and helping them to continue their uh, education. I'm sure you know more about that than I do, and if any of you are interested in following up on that, it's extremely important that universities get on board with this effort and uh, assist, put some of their mighty fundraising chops behind, uh, behind this effort, um, because I, I feel sure that uh, many students and faculty would be very um, eager to um, welcome the, to be part of the welcome core on campus, the WCC, which is uh, helping to support refugee students. So um, look into it, and uh, perhaps you can talk to this young man <laughs> if you want to know more about it, because uh, I, I, uh, I believe he does. Other questions? I was going to ask, recognizing the tragedy of the commons, is there a best way forward for international cooperation in order to reform? Um, UN resolution, possibly. Uh, I mean, even with the death of a two-year-old child, that you know sparks international outrage. Uh, what is the best way forward, in your opinion, um, for states? Thank you. Well, thanks for the easy questions. <laughs> um, it's a really, it's a really difficult one, um, and the, uh, I mean, the answer is, um, of course international cooperation. And there have been instances of that. Probably the, the most uh, dramatic and, and certainly by far the largest uh, organized cooperation to um, rescue and provide for 
uh, migrants at sea was in the aftermath of the Vietnam War, uh, where the countries that had been involved in the, as, as you may know, the boat people from Vietnam were trying to reach countries in Southeast Asia across the South China Sea, subject to vicious attacks by pirates, um, uh, inadequate vessels, inadequate food and water on board, and, and just about every kind of horror you can think of. And um, this, this, the countries involved in the war, US, France, Britain, Australia, uh, and others decided they had to intervene and eventually, uh, first of all, rescued people in the South China Sea who were put in camps in Malaysia, Thailand, other countries of the region, um, who eventually said, hang on, <laughs> you know, we, we can't handle this and it's not our responsibility. So uh, eventually a, a conference uh, was held which um, agreed to uh, not only to empty the camps, but to um, have intercepted people either go directly to these countries or to have a refugee determination process eventually. Uh, and those who uh, were judged not to be refugees, but to be poor farmers suffering from drought, um, who might have been very deserving of help, but were not refugees, would be sent back to North Vietnam. And this eventually calmed uh, the situation. Um, but it was a long time ago, and um, there has not been anything on that scale since. Europe has failed dramatically and disgracefully to um, cooperate on distributing refugees around the country. First in 2015, 2016, Germany with 800,000 migrants uh, in a very short period appealed for help from other European countries. They didn't get it. Italy in 2014 after that terrible fiery shipwreck off Lampedusa put the Italian Navy into the Mediterranean and started rescuing people at something like 11 million euros a month and said to the other European countries, you know, come on guys, uh, we need your help, we need your ships, we need your money, we need resettlement places for these people, was not forthcoming. So the operation ended um, and was replaced with very inadequate pan-European um, effort. So um, these, these are, and, and now Italy with over 100,000 migrants this year has gotten no cooperation from, um, from other European countries. In fact, Germany has pulled out of one of the agreements, uh, sort of mild agreements they had because they said, well, Italy under the Dublin Convention is supposed to take back people who land in Italy first and then go to another country. And, and, you know, and Italy said, you must be joking. You know, we've got all these people. And a few have made their way to Germany or Sweden or France or wherever. And you want to send them back to us? Uh, so I can tell you what is needed. I can't tell you how to get there. <laughs> so far, um, there have been only very uh, modest efforts at cooperation, some of them quite bizarre like the US and Australia agreed to swap refugees. They had refugees who had reached Australia, had reached the US territory, uh, who were being held in Guantanamo and in Christmas Island, I believe, um, who uh, said, we, we, we can't allow these people to enter our countries because it will attract others. So the Australians sent their refugees to the US, and the US sent their refugees to Australia. So these people had no support systems, no family, couldn't, you know. Um, it, it was a small number, but it was the sort of height of, of surreal approaches to this problem. Um, what we need clearly is more international cooperation, more enforcement, particularly of the smuggling and trafficking protocols, and 
and policing of of seas like the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, where you know we don't even know the the scale of the horrors that are that are going on there. Um, but there just aren't enough capable states that um, see this as, as their problem. We have two more. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I'm from South Korean Navy officer retired captain. Welcome. And I have a lot of experience to uh, the voice the uh, ocean, but that supporter uh, become uh, moving and participate this debate. My question is, what's the appropriate logic or cause cause to I mean uh, uh, state moving or who are I mean reluctant and willing or abrasive country to get involved in maritime uh, refugee issues. Then, as you said in your comments, you refers to many times unwillingness, reluctance of of involving. Mm -hmm. And then the key issue is how could the the related or um, associate countries uh, portray them who are abrasive. Uh, I I, took an, uh, I will take an example of South Korean case. We all ha we have some problem of North Korean refugees and defector, but our constitution defines that Korea is uh, not only South Korea but also whole Korean Peninsula. Then automatically the refugee came to South, come to South Korea, they will be given our citizenship. Then then. That's my question. Okay. Thank you. It's a good question. How do you motivate states to get involved in, in, in this issue? I think uh, I've emphasized some of the differences with sort of more classic tragedies of the commons with, when looking at maritime migration. But I think this is one area where there really is uh, uh, the same kinds of solutions that those who are First, exploiting and then suffering from the uh, exhaustion of uh, commons uh, eventually um, get together to protect that common area. You know, some of the feeble efforts you see to protect tropical forests or coral reefs or um, so on uh, fall into that category. And I think it's important to emphasize that um, that. Every country is at risk um, when the rules of maritime re search and rescue aren't, um, aren't observed. One of the first cases of one of the, res the NGO rescue boats operating in the Mediterranean, the first rescue they made was of a fisherman and his son whose engine had conked out. They weren't migrants, they weren't refugees, they were seafarers. And I think it's important to emphasize that when ships turn off their transponders or when uh, rescue, search and rescue zone missions don't respond, it's not just migrants who are at risk. Uh, it's, your, it's your own nationals who travel by boat, who are mariners, who are fishermen, who are um, yachtsmen <laughs> who are, you know, pleasure boaters. Um, and, uh, and there certainly, you know, are instances where, where those people, like that fisherman and his son, have been dependent on the conventions of search and rescue. So, you know, all nationalities are at risk if these are not, um, if these rules are not observed. And um, that's, you know, may not be very persuasive to some governments who think, well, it's only a tiny number of our citizens who might be at risk. Uh, but, you know, they also have a stake in a rules-based international order, something you'll hear a lot about today, I'm sure. And, uh, and, and the, the, the maritime law 
is one of the most successful areas in terms of um, having countries sign on to these treaties. And even though the institutions set up to, to implement those treaties may be inadequate, they do exist. Um, so I, th I think that that's a sort of two parts of a, of a very complex answer. Do we have time for one more, Ellen? Yeah. Kathleen. Hi there. Thank you. Um, I'm with the Center for Security Policy Study Fellows Program. Um, and I was just curious if you could touch a little bit more on um, the Migration Policy Institute and some of the mechanisms and practices that they use either in research or um, in programming to respond to the migrant issue? <laughs> well, thank you uh, for that question. <laughs> um, the Migration Policy Institute is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, <coughs> in, <laughs> excuse me, research and policy institute, which a colleague and I set up 22 years ago. <laughs> Amazing. And um, our role as we see it is to present evidence-based, fact-based, analytically-based um, options for actors in the migration space to, um, to institute uh, smarter and more effective policies and more humane policies. Um, we are not very interested. We are interested in border management, but we're not very interested in deterrence and um, deflection of migrants, much less uh, punitive uh, or even lethal approaches to migration. Uh, but we do um, do deep dives, uh, research, and then <coughs> really been talking too long. My throat will tell me that if the clock won't. <laughs> um, um, and then uh, we, in addition to our research and analysis and recommendations, we make a major and, and really, I'd say, quite successful effort to reach decision makers with those recommendations. And many of them do really rely on us, reach out to us when they are faced with a dilemma to say, you know, what are our options here? What can we do? And when I say um, decision makers, I don't just mean in government. We also interact with um, international NGOs, with international organizations, um, the UN system particularly, but also regional organizations, and the private sector, um, and um, try to get a a good mix of viewpoints. We have a, we have a, a lot of um, small private roundtables, big public um, um, symposia and um, conferences and so on. And we try to get a good mix of, of uh, viewpoints represented in those. Um, I can talk to you more about that or anyone else um, sort of offline. But um, that's, that's more or less MPI, 22 years on. And uh, it's, it's worked out, <laughs> much to the astonishment of people who told us we were crazy when we tried to start one week after September 11th. <laughs> Ellen, thank you. Perfect question just to promote uh, the important work of the Migration Policy Institute. This is the book on um, All at Sea about that will fill in, e in, even in addition to this very compelling and comprehensive talk. Um, Thank you. Um, so I want to just express my deepest thanks to Kathleen for getting us off to a sober but very, uh, you know, uh, enriching and, and in, in inspiring uh, beginning to the day. And so please join me in thanking Kathleen. Thank and we'll you. have about an eight minute break before the next panel. I'm uh, sorry, I was, I was, I neglected to mention our, the resources that are available from MPI, which are astonishingly deep and rich, um, and you can find them at uh, migrationpolicy.org. We have an online journal called the Migration Information Source, 
and publish lots of policy briefs and books and things. So I encourage you to, to look at them um, if you're remotely interested in migration. <laughs> Thanks, Alice. Thank you. Thank you.